some background about what's been happening in, in agriculture, uh, in diets in developing countries. So we, you know, we know that uh, vitamin, mineral and vitamin deficiencies are a very uh, serious public health problem in developing countries. So what's the background? What's, what's going on? Why, why is that happening? Why do we have that situation? So this is, a, this is a diagram that I've been showing for many years, and it shows what's been happening with uh, what, we, what we dub as the Green Revolution. And what that dashed red line across the middle is, is a 100% increase between 1965 and 1999. And you see the blue bars is developing country population. So the population doubled during that period and policymakers knew that that huge population explosion was gonna happen. And back in the early 60s, they were worried about uh, widespread famine. Would there be enough uh, food staples uh, for people to keep from going hungry? So the, the centers for the agricultural research centers for the system that I work for, uh, developed high-yielding varieties of rice and wheat and maize, and they were widely adopted, especially in South Asia. And that's what that's represented by the orange bars in the diagram. So production increased rapidly, uh, production more than doubled during that period. But what I what I want to bring your attention to are the green bars, and that's pulse production. And that's just a marker for vegetables, uh, for fruits, for animal and fish products, all the non-staple foods that are supposed to be providing dietary quality. You didn't have the same productivity increases. So for example, pulse production increased by about 25%, but it didn't keep uh, pace with population growth. So what happens to food prices when you have the, that kind of a shift? in supply and demand. So these are some price data for India, and uh, it shows that rice prices and wheat prices in India fell dramatically by, by 40% once the, uh, the high yielding varieties came online and, they, and, and uh, cereal prices remained low in India for many, many decades. And now more recently, they're, they're starting to come back up but just to the level that they were in the early 70s. So these are data from India, but if you look at data all over uh, South Asia and also for Africa, you'll see this pattern. But this is the, this next slide is the real kicker. Um, um, oh wait, I didn't, so there was, there was, um, there used to be a slide on the non-staple food prices, but somehow that, that, um, didn't get included, but uh, the the diagram for non-staple food prices um, would show that the non-staple food prices, so vegetables, fruits, um, animal products, those prices doubled and tripled over time. So the the problem is to get better dietary quality now, the poor have to pay more and more for for these non-staple foods which are supposed to provide uh, the quality uh, in diets. So this, uh, this very simple diagram, uh, if you look at the rectangle on the left, if that was the total mineral and vitamin requirements uh, for the total population in developing countries, you'll see that the green shaded area is the part that's provided by the food supply and it, it, does, it isn't coming close to providing enough minerals and vitamins that people need. So the nutrition community has um, come in with supplementation and fortification to try to close the gap. And of course, that yellow portion are the people that aren't, aren't reached by dietary quality or by the supplementation and fortification programs. So as we look forward into the future, the you know one of the key things that needs to happen is that agriculture needs to provide a much higher percentage of the minerals and vitamins uh, that are required by developing country populations. It's because of the shortage and because of the high prices of the non-staple foods that we see so much mineral and vitamin deficiencies. 
will always need supplementation and fortification, but it's much more efficient and much more sustainable for the to provide them in the food supply. So this is uh, these are some data for Bangladesh. I want to I want to show what typical dietary patterns look like in developing countries, and the same pattern happens uh, in country after country. So I like to divide the diet into food staples, non-staple plant foods, fish and animal foods. So food staples. Look at look at the um, look at how constant it is across lower income and higher income. These aren't the higher income people aren't really high income; they're just higher than the lower income groups. And you can see that in Bangladesh, food staples is basically everyone eats rice. So rice consumption is more or less constant across income groups. So what the what the very poor do is they spend what money they have. To keep from going hungry, and they they max in some sense they maximize already their rice consumption, and then at the margin what they do they spend extra income first on non-staple plant foods, and then next on fish and animal products. So you can see that the non-staple plant foods uh, the consumption maybe increases by fifty percent, about fifty percent from low income to high income. And you can see that the fish and animal foods double from low income to high income. But the quantities are very small, especially the quantities of the fish and animal foods, because they're 20 times as expensive a source of calories as, uh, as is rice. So this is, this is the underlying cause for the mineral and vitamin deficiencies is that people want to eat a healthy diet. They want dietary quality. They want more non-staple plant foods. They want more fish and animal foods in their diets, but they simply can't afford them, not only because of low incomes, but also because the prices are rising of the non-staple foods. So this is, I, I don't have time to go into all the statistics, but this is just some of the, the magnitude of the problem. So vitamin, vitamin A supplementation trials showed 30 years ago that by administering one uh, vitamin supplement every six months to preschool children, the child mortality could be lowered by 23%. So that's an indication of, of the seriousness of vitamin A deficiency. It's estimated that 375,000 children go blind each year. And then once vitamin A deficiency is that serious, most of those children will, will also die soon after going blind. Uh, iron deficiency, about 2 billion mothers and children are subject to iron deficiency, at risk for iron deficiency. Um, it impairs cognitive abilities of children uh, when they're young, and it's something that uh, can't be reversed. And, so, and the, some of the magnitudes are, are quite shocking. So 82% of children in India less than two years old are anemic, and half of that is due to iron deficiency. Similarly, zinc deficiency, um, uh, about 2 billion mothers and children are at risk for zinc deficiency. Uh, zinc deficiency compromises your immune system. It's also associated with stunting of children. And 450,000 deaths are associated with uh, zinc deficiency among children uh, each year. So these minerals and vitamin deficiencies are quite serious um, public health problems. So, so what? So now, with that as with that as background about what's been happening with dietary quality and the seriousness. So, what is biofortification? Um, and I use this slide to explain what biofortification is. So, the most widely eaten food staple in Africa is maize. Africans prefer white maize. So you see the white maize in the picture. White maize has no vitamin A whatsoever in it. And yet vitamin A deficiency among preschool children is, is very high, maybe 40% among children in Africa. The yellow maize, there is yellow maize. Africans tend not to like yellow maize. They don't like the, they don't like the taste. And in any event, it's considered livestock feed and it doesn't have very much vitamin A in it actually. So that orange maize in the middle, 
uh, was developed by the Harvest, our collaborators uh, through the Harvest Plus funding. And that, that orange maize um, is just as high yielding as the white maize. And on any given day, a family that substitutes the orange maize for the white maize in their diets, they'll get an extra 40% of the estimated average requirement of vitamin A in their diets. So because it's high yielding, the orange maize will sell for the same price in the markets as the white maize. So that's a value proposition to the mothers. If you will if you will grow and buy and eat the orange maize for the same price without sacrificing yields, you will protect your family from vitamin A deficiency by getting an extra 40% of your requirements in your family's diets. So when they're presented with this value proposition, what did the mothers say? Well, they ask how it tastes. So we do the blind taste tests and they, there is a difference in taste and they, they can detect, most mothers detect and they identify the, the orange maize from the white maize. But fortunately, it's a little bit sweeter than the white maize and they like the taste of the orange maize. So then, it's, then it becomes a, a no brainer. So uh, for the same price, they like to the taste, why not, why not add the vitamin A uh, to the diets? So this is essentially what we're trying to do is over the next 20 years, 25 years, say, we want, we would like that all the white maize is replaced by orange maize. And that's kind of the task that we're undertaking right now uh, with Harvest Plus. So my vision is that 20, 25 years from now, uh, a grandchild will ask the grandmother and say, I heard there used to be such a thing as white maize. Is that true? And the grandmother would say, yes, yes, when I was a child, we used to eat white maize. And the example that I give uh, for carrots is that most people don't know that carrots used to be white. And they just accept that carrots are orange and that the, and, and carrots in the United States, at least, provide about 30 percent of our vitamin A intake. And that was uh, that was a combination of factors, but it included some breeding by the by the USDA to increase the vitamin A levels in carrots. So, in essence, that's what uh, that's the basically what biofortification is all about. Oh, I should add that because um, this question always comes up, I should add that we used conventional breeding techniques to develop the orange maize. It always comes up. Oh, is this GMO? It's not a GMO. All of, the, all of the products that I'll talk about under Harvest Plus were developed using conventional breeding techniques. None of them are GMOs. Uh, we don't consider GMOs dangerous at Harvest Plus. Um, we wish we could use GMO techniques, but uh, because of political constraints, we know that uh, there'll be blockages to the release of those products. We'll invest in GMOs and they'll just sit on the shelf and they won't do anybody any good. So these are all conventionally bred products. So these, these are our products that we've been working on. The ones in the, the blue shading are the ones that we've invested the most in. We've done the most work on. So we have high zinc rice, high zinc wheat. I've talked about the high pro vitamin A maize. We have high iron pearl millet. We have high pro vitamin A cassava. The best known biofortified crop is probably the high pro vitamin A orange sweet potato, and we have high iron beans. We've also done some work on uh, high iron zinc and uh, high iron zinc sorghum, also iron and zinc potato, pro vitamin A bananas, high iron cowpea, and high iron and zinc lentils. But we haven't we haven't invested in much as, as much in those crops. So this is a global map. Um, we've released bio, we've bred high yielding varieties. They've been released by varietal release committees in over 30 countries. Um, they're in testing and will be released in additional countries in the next four or five years. In the next four or five years, we'll have releases in 60 countries. So you can't read the detail on this slide, but it's, it's now a global program. Harvest Plus has been operating for a little over 15 years now, and it's it's taken, it, you know, the plant breeding process is a, uh, yeah, takes time. It takes 10 to 12 years. So, um, uh, you know, now we're we're globally we have a lot of breadth, 
and now we we need to get depth we need to get uh, a high level of adoption of the crops and that's that's the big challenge under harvest plus um the big the for me the big advantage of um biofortification is that uh, agricultural research is a very cost effective way of bringing extra nutrients to people you invest in agricultural research up front even though it's a slow process initially once the crops are in the are in the food system uh, there, there aren't the recurrent costs. When we give vitamin A supplements or when you fortify foods, you have recurrent costs. You have the same costs year after year after year. With agricultural research, the investments are up front. The, the costs of research are much lower than the costs of fortification and supplementation. So, um, the, the crops, what we're doing is we're, we're piggybacking on the best crops that are coming out of agricultural research centers. So our, our system is developing heat and drought tolerant beans. And so we're making sure that those heat and drought tolerant beans are also high in iron. Also, um, in response to climate change, we have drought tolerant maize. We have flood submergence tolerant rice. Those rices are high in zinc. Those mazes are high in provitamin A. So the, the biofortified crops are climate smart. So recent, also related to climate change, recent research has shown that with the um, crops being grown under high levels of CO2, so the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are going up over time, and when crops are grown under, under high CO2 levels, their, their vegetative um, growth is, is stronger and the density of minerals in the seeds is going down over time. So, um, so biofortification is a way of countering this negative trend in the quality of the staple foods uh, that people will be eating in the future. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a bit of summary about the plant breeding activities that we've undertaken. Now about the nutrition activities, um, as I've already mentioned, on any given day, if you substitute the biofortified crop for the non-biofortified crop, given the target levels that we're breeding into the crops, you'll get an extra 40% of the estimated average requirements uh, in the diet. That just gives an idea of the magnitude of what we're putting in the crops. Then initially, um, the nutrition community was asking a lot of questions about, well, okay, are the levels, will the, will the nutrients be bioavailable? Uh, will they be uh, enough to have a significant public health impact? So we've had to develop evidence on that. So we've, under Harvest Plus program, we've uh, commissioned 14 efficacy trials and now, and it's taken a long time, it's, it's been a process again over 10 years. Now we've published the studies. Uh, we've, shown, um, we've shown that iron status improves. Uh, we've done a meta-analysis of, of uh, several different trials uh, showing an improvement in iron status. We've shown that high provitamin A uh, crops improve vitamin A status. Those have been uh, published. With the high zinc crops, um, we haven't established that zinc status has improved, but it's, it's primarily because the nutritionists don't yet have a good uh, uh, biomarker of zinc status of individuals. Um, serum zinc is, is okay for populations, but it, isn't, it doesn't work that well for, for individuals and for efficacy trials. Um, but and it's shown on the next slide, we've been able to, and what's actually more important than showing change in status is showing improvements in functional outcomes. So for example, the high iron beans and the high iron pearl millet, we've been able to show improved cognitive function in our efficacy trials for both children and women and better work performance uh, among women. 
And for the high zinc wheat, um, our efficacy trials have shown reduced morbidity. So uh, mother-child pairs that were fed high zinc wheat in India uh, showed lower levels of pneumonia and other morbidities than mother-child pairs that were uh, fed just the regular wheat. So even though we didn't show an improvement in zinc status, we showed an improvement in, uh, in morbidity patterns. So we've, you know, we've, we've established the nutritional efficacy um, of biofortification. And so now it's, it's accepted by the international nutrition community as, a, as an important intervention that, need, that can be implemented along with many other interventions uh, that are required. So how are we, how are we disseminating? Uh, so, okay, we, we've done the plant breeding, we've got the varieties released, we've done the nutrition studies. So now the third step in the process is to get high levels of adoption of the crops. And we have a long way to go. Uh, we've got, we, we estimate that now about 10 million farms are growing biofortified crops around the world. That represents 40 or 50 million people just on farms that are growing the biofortified crops. But we have very ambitious targets. Uh, over the next 20 years, as I've said, we want, we want most staple foods uh, to be uh, biofortified foods after another 20, 25 years by, by basically by piggybacking on the best agronomic properties. So I have an example here from Rwanda where we've been, where we've, we released our first varieties in around 2010, 2011. So you can see that we released 10 bean varieties in Rwanda in this slide, and they're high yielding. They're high yielding beans, high in iron. And we had, uh, we had funding uh, from donors to make the bean seeds available. And you can see these, uh, you know, these dots all over the map of Rwanda. We had different types of programs for making bean seed available to farmers. Um, I won't go into the different methods uh, that we had. Different colors represent different methods. But you can see that we, we covered the whole country. And we did a nationwide survey in 2015 of farm households. And we, we, we found that we'd reached already about 30, after four years, we'd reached about 30% about of farmers in Rwanda had tried growing the high iron beans. And um, I think the most important figure is right in the middle of this slide. You have both climbing beans and bush beans. And are the yields of the biofortified beans are 20% higher than the yields of the beans that the farmers are currently growing. They're not higher yielding because they're biofortified. They're higher yielding because we're piggybacking on the best agronomic properties of the, uh, the varieties that are, the modern varieties that are being released by the agricultural research centers. And now we're aggressively promoting these high yielding varieties among farmers um, in Rwanda and other countries as well. And now we estimate that about 20% of total bean production in Rwanda are high iron beans. You can't see the iron in the beans, you can't taste the iron in the beans. Why, do, why, why are they popular? Why have they spread so quickly? Because they're high yielding. And that's, you know, that's the basic, uh, the basic strategy that we're using for disseminating, especially the high iron and the high zinc crops. Now, when you have a high pro vitamin A crop like the orange maize, you can't just rely on the high yields to drive dissemination. You also have to let consumers know about the orange varieties, why they've changed color, what the benefit is, and you have to build a value chain for those crops a separate value chain for the yellow and orange crops. So uh, the next few slides are some examples of that. Uh, this is orange sweet potato puree that uh, techniques have been developed so that they, these puree packages can be stored without refrigeration over long periods of time. Then they can be opened and used as ingredients in various types of uh, uh, foods that are, you know, 
as one one element in the recipe. Um, so other examples, um, you can see this is the orange maize meal uh, that's being sold in, in grocery stores in Lusaka in Zambia. We're not really targeting people who buy uh, their maize meal in, uh, in Lusaka, but our goal is that 100% or near 100% of orange maize meal in Zambia will be orange at some point, or all, all of the maize meal will be orange. And so you've got to build the value chains and start the process, let everybody know, and let, let orange become the normal, the new normal, rather than white. So we have to build those value chains. And then you can see also in Nigeria with the yellow cassava, we have yellow gari and we're selling yellow gari in packages and we're creating demand through various uh, means in Nigeria. So it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit more difficult with the with the yellow orange biofortified products than it is with the iron and the zinc. Okay, so I've gone on for 25 minutes or so about biofortification, and the title was about uh, school. Oh wait, one final slide. I'll I'll mention that uh, orange corn is also now available. You can buy it on Amazon. You can get orange maize grits. Uh, just uh, Google Professor Torbert, who's, an, who's a maize geneticist at Purdue University. Uh, he helped us with identifying some of the genes with conventional breeding for developing the orange maize. And Purdue University owns the patent for orange maize uh, in the United States, and he started a small business. So if you want uh, orange maize grits, um, go on Amazon. You can purchase them. Um, uh, I, I got this one last slide. Sorry, I got ahead of myself on the school feeding. So um, we're mainstreaming now through key stakeholders, the biofortification. So we're getting public agriculture research and private seed companies developing mainstreaming biofortified uh, lines of crops. Uh, we're starting to talk to food companies about marketing biofortified varieties, using them as ingredients. The World Bank now is starting to make loan when they're making loans to governments in Africa. Part of the uh, loan agreement is to provide funding for scale up of biofortified crops. Uh, I'll talk about examples of the World Food Program using biofortified crops in their school feeding programs. The national governments of Brazil, China, and India, we've stimulated and gotten them to their agriculture research establishments are now have independently funded biofortification uh, programs. And we're working with uh, international NGOs to scale up. We have a, we have a very uh, important new partnership with the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. We've, we've selected six countries and we've gotten funding to work with GAIN to scale up biofortified crops in six countries. Okay, so that's, those are, the, those are all the slides. Now let's talk a little bit about school feeding. So what we, what we tell uh, organizations is that wherever you have a, wherever there's a program where you have a staple food crop, whatever that program might be, all you have to do is substitute one for one the biofortified seed or the biofortified food in place of the non-biofortified, and you've added, you've automatically added a nutritional dimension to your program. So for example, here's some slides uh, that show uh, school feeding programs with the vitamin A orange maize. Well, those school feeding programs before as part of the school meal, they were providing white maize. So we just substitute the orange maize for that. So that's, um, it's just that simple. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on school feeding programs. But uh, children bring home important nutrition messages to their families uh, when the biofortified crops are provided in the school feeding programs. And so they, they also can impact diets when they, when they go home and talk about what they've been eating uh, in school. So something's come up on my screen here. It's gotten in the way. Uh, okay, wait a second. Okay. Next slide. 
So this is uh, this is an example uh, in Zim another example in Zimbabwe. In 2018, we were invited by the Ministry of Education and the World Food Program to the Third Africa School Feeding Day. Um, and you know, we talked about using the orange maize in school feeding programs. Um, there are various ways uh, you can you know Harvest Plus can donate initial seeds. For these programs, other school feeding programs um, get farmers. Uh, you know, they arrange with farmers in in the local area to grow to grow the foods. In this instance, the biofortified crops, and then they purchase from local farmers. In other cases, the children grow the grow the foods at, at the school themselves, along with the with the faculty. 